master used to say his teaching his method the path of the masters sant mat is meant for the brave not for the weak you have to be a warrior he used to use the word you have to be a warrior to be in this path why did he say that what is the need to be brave and warrior in order to meditate and find yourself he explained that many of us cannot cope up with the pralabd the destiny we are born with and we try to run away from it we are cowards if we cannot face what we designed as an experience of destiny then that is not a spiritual path at all that's escapism the path of the master says you should be strong and be warriors and face your life where you have been placed in the middle cope up with all the ups and downs of destiny and then in the middle of it escape and go back to your home from this network into which you have come Hello welcome to satsang everyone have a nice week a happy week and we will start the satsang today with a song by Marzina have i told lately that i love you then we have a talk by Michael and we will hear a story by Jasprit the kings and his three questions after that we have 5 minutes of meditation and master's youtube talk 
and then we'll have group meditation with love and devotion. Thank you so much. Let's start. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's no one else above you? You fill my heart with gladness, take away all my sadness, ease my troubles, that's what you do for the morning sun and all its glory greets the day with hope and comfort too you fill my life with laughter and somehow you make it better ease my troubles that's what you do there's a love that's divine, and it's yours and it's mine, like the sun. And at the end of the day, we should give thanks and pray to the one, to the one. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's no one else above you? You fill my heart with gladness, take away all my sadness, ease my troubles, that's what you do. There is a love that's divine, and it's yours and it's mine, like the sun. And at the end of the day, we should give thanks and pray to the one, to the one. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's no one else above you? You fill my heart with gladness. Take away all my sadness, ease my troubles, that's what you do. Take away all my sadness, fill my life with gladness, ease my troubles, that's what you do. Ease my troubles, that's what you do. Wow, Mirzana, good morning. Thank you so much for your beautiful song. You fill our heart with gladness, your godly voice and your devotion to Master. You and Jason, you are very, very valuable, our holy family. We, I love you. We love you so much, so much. Um, thank you for your seva and your godly voice. And the message in the song, you fill our heart with gladness. And that's what Master really does. He fills our heart with gladness. Every time we take a look of, of, on Master, every time we listen to Master, every time we just think of Master, then some our heart is filled with gladness. And our sadness goes away. Our sadness goes away. And we have a joy. We have a joy in our heart. He's the source of all joy. He's the source of all joy. He's the source of all beauty. He's the source of everything. And just to think of master is the greatest, the greatest gift that God made, God gave to man. The greatest gift of the perfect living master. Whoever, whoever have a perfect living master is the luckiest person. He has won or she has won the spiritual lottery and is a billionaire in richness of God, 
all the treasures of God lay in front of the lover. That whatever God has, he gives us when we are in love. As, he melt, as we melt in him, ultimately. And ultimately, the barriers and the separations and the curtains of darkness will be removed. And all what will be left in us is just master. And we will be lutes, instruments for God, where God can play his holy music, where God can play his holy music through us when we become empty and when we become total instruments of the Lord. Wow, I can't wait for that day when we all are hollowed from within and all our darkness is vacuumed out by the lover, by the beloved, and all what is left inside of our core is God. That day will happen to all of the lovers, all of the lovers of Ishwar Puriji, all the lovers of Baba Sawan Singh, Santakar Singh, and the perfect ones who came and touched us with their touchstone. They touched our heart and they changed it. No matter what, what teacher, you know, they say everything is God. Everything is God. And every moment of our life was to bring us closer to God, whether it was full of pain or whether it was full of joy. We have learned a lesson and we have been moved a step closer towards divinity. Every moment of our life, every teacher that came in our life, that was a full manifestation of our inner self. It was a full manifestation of God inside of us. And that teacher was needed, starting from the mother, who Ishwar Puri Ji says is our first master. Starting from our mother, that was our first master. She has nourished us. She gave us the love. And, and, and she taught us so much. She was our first master. And then we graduated to the teacher, master, the kindergarten teacher. They were like masters in different ways for us. And we have gratitudes for all the teachers who came in our life. We have to have gratitude. Otherwise, we cannot proceed on the path of love. If we don't have gratitude for all, then we are limited, limiting our vision. We are saying that we are limited limited in our unconditional love. That love is unconditional. And if every moment was God, every moment is designed by God, then we have to appreciate every moment in our life. We have to appreciate all our teachers, from our mom to our school teachers to the, the, the masters that came in our life. We appreciate them. We needed them. Our inner self manifested them at that time. And they taught us something. They taught us something divine and they took us one step towards God. So all our teachers, all our divine teachers in our life, we value them and we have full gratitude, full gratitude towards them, full gratitude. And, and that, way, that way we expand ourselves to come from conditioned to unconditional, from finite to infinite. As this is our way, this is, this is our path, is to become from one, from, from many to one, and from one to many, that oneness is our goal. Oneness is our goal. And the one, the beloved, is unconditional love. He's unconditional love. Um, and his love is so, 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 so unfathomable, unfathomable. And that is what will happen to us. Today, I want to read to you about the saint. Her name was Rabia of Basra. Her name is Rabia of Basra. Um, if we also think that God can speak only through a, a man, we are limiting ourselves totally, as there are as many perfect masters who were women as men, as God speaks through men and women, uh, whoever becomes his instrument then God can use that instrument. And this woman, Rabia, and since God is unconditional love, this Rabia, and I will read to you the story of her life, she was sold into slavery when she was young. And uh, they put her in a brothel, and she had to work there for many years. Um, yet, yet, she 
was in love with God and and God did not judge her. God did not judge her. He had like unconditional love for her. And that unconditional love for her beloved, it made her into a great saint and a great poet. And one of her poems, she says, um, she says, God asked her, where do you have pain? And then all the cells of her body started screaming and weeping that the, of pain of separation, of pain of separation, all the cells of her body started weeping with pains of separation. And, uh, and uh, you know how Dr. Chan said that we have trillions of cells and each cell has a soul, each cell has a soul. So we are a combination. We like represent the whole creation of Lord God. We are like, everything is inside the human body. Everything is inside the human body. And then every cell of her body started screaming to God. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and then uh, what happened? Then God, God gave her a gift to take all her suffering away. And she said, even the sun started paying homage to her face. But the real gift that God gave, gave her to relieve her pains and suffering of this life, she cannot describe. That's what she was saying. So I want to read to you uh, about her life, about her life and, uh, and some of her poetry. As Hafez says, Hafez says, you know, poems, especially when they come from a perfect master, they are, li they are like light poured into a cup and then this cup lifted to our mouth. This is what divine poems are they are the the poem the poet who has an inferno inferno of love for god in his heart and in every cell of his or her body an inferno of love that love becomes light becomes light and becomes a poem and is poured into a cup and then served to us so all these poems that we read from Hafiz, from Rumi, from Shams, from, from, from all those divine masters is just light poured into a cup and then lifted to our mouth. And then we enjoy, we enjoy, we partake of that mana of life, of that water of life, of that love. We drink the love of God. We drink the love of God and we enjoy, we enjoy the love of God. Through the, po through the poetry. So Rabia, one of her poems, she says, when God said, my hands are yours, I saw that I could heal any creature in this world. I saw that the divine beauty in each heart is the root of all time and space. I saw that the divine beauty in each heart is the root of all time and space. And when God said, my hands are yours, that means she became one with God. She could heal any heart in this world, any creature in this world. Rabia of Basra, um, she was born in 17, uh, uh, 717 to 801 C uh, after Christ. We, uh, is without doubt the most popular and influential of female Islamic saints and the central figure in the Sufi tradition. She was born nearly 500 years before Rumi. And although it is rarely said, she perhaps more than any other poet influenced his writing. Rabia grew up in, in a part of ancient Mesopotamia that is now Iraq, Iraq. She was the fourth daughter of impoverished parents. And the story connected with her birth tells of the Prophet Muhammad appearing to her father in a dream to tell him that his daughter would be revered as a great saint. The sensuousness of Rabia's poetry may be a bit shocking to some, though it was probably more so in its original. Even conservative scholarly translations cannot get around it. At times, graphic eroticism 
many myths surround her life and poems, but one has been recently confirmed by one of the most respected contemporary spiritual teachers and may well be a source of this sensuality. When Rabia was quite young, she became separated from her parents. Perhaps they died. And while wandering homeless, she was literally stolen and sold into slavery because, because of her remarkable beauty. A famous brothel bought her for a large sum and it is believed she lived and was forced to work as one might in a brothel for many years. She wrote, what a place for trials and transformation did my lover put me. But never once did he look upon me as if I were impure. Dear sisters, all we do in this world, whatever happens, is bringing us closer to God. I love this. Rabia may be a timely spiritual voice for women of this century. Oh. When she was about 50, she was given her freedom, most likely bought for her by a rich patron. The remaining years of her life were devoted to meditation and prayer, and she would often see visitors seeking guidance about their lives. Many miracles are attributed to her. And apparently, she was offered large sums for curing people. I like a comment attributed to her when refusing a bag of gold. Dear, if you leave that, flies will gather as if a horse just released, relieved himself. And I might slip in it while dancing. She was doing it as selfless service. She refused a bag of gold. At this, As this great woman once wrote, Show me where it hurts, God, and every cell in my body burst into tears before his tender eyes. He has repaid me, though for all my sufferings in a way I never wanted. The sun is now in homage to my face because it knows I have seen God. But that was not his payment. The soul cannot describe his gift. I just spoke about the sun like that because I like beautiful words and because it is true, creation is in homage to us. Her first poem in this, it says, one day he did not leave after kissing me. Wow, that's, that's the poem. One day, one day he did not leave after kissing me. That means she had her master 24-7, like Ishwar Puriji. Our beauty. Live with dignity. Women, live with dignity. Men, few things will more enhance our beauty as much. The perfect stillness. Love is the perfect stillness. And the greatest excitement and most profound act. And the word almost as complete as his name. The perfect still, love is the perfect stillness. I love that. This, this line has a whole satsang in it, that love makes us still, makes our mind quiet. The way it goes. Why think God has not touched everything that comes to your desk? Question mark, true. He may have kept the best for himself. That is just the way it goes. Hmm? Die before you die. Ironic, but one of the most intimate acts of our body is death. One of the most intimate acts of our body is death. death. So beautiful appeared my death, knowing who then I would kiss. I died a thousand times before I died. Die before you die, said the prophet Muhammad. Have wings that feared ever, have wings that feared ever touched the sun. I was born when all I once feared I could love. The moment's depth. I love this, just the, just the heading of this poem. The moment's depth. 
that you know how Ishwar Puriji says, don't think of the future and don't think of the past. They are gone and the future is not in our hand, but catch the present. And in the present, this present has a depth in it. That's what the heading of the poem says, that the moment's depth, every moment has a depth in it. And this depth can become unfathomable if we are in touch with the Lord. If we are in touch with God, with Master, this moment is very deep, it becomes a deep moment when we are thinking of God in this moment, in this present. We are catching the present. That's the, the, just that line is so beautiful. The moment's depth is greater than that of the future, she's saying. And from the fields of the past, what can you harvest again? Dried flowers I have from a meadow I laid in with her and moved across her breasts. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that's her poem. When I need love scent, I touch them. A mine with jewels can be the past for the heart. A mine with jewels can be the past for a heart. But who goes to an old mine that only made you sad? That means like the past made us sad, some of it. So why think of it? It's like a dry meadows, dry, dried flowers. I have seen a man walk on a high stretched rope, holding a long pole for balance. Memories and dreams can do that. Be a great help. The soul does not understand the word seasons. The petals on the sun can only be touched now. Wow, the soul does not understand the word seasons. The petals on the sun can only be touched now. In this moment, the beauty of dried flowers, how can they compare to him? Him is the now. The sky gave me its heart. The sky gave me its heart because it knew mine was not large enough to care for the earth the way it did. The sky gave me its heart. The sky gave me its heart because it knew mine was not large enough to care for the earth the way it did. Why is it we think of God so much? Why is there so much talk about love? When an animal is wounded, no one has to tell it. You need to heal. So naturally, it will nurse itself the best it can. My eye kept telling me, Something is missing from all I see. So it went in search of the cure. My eye kept telling me something is missing from all I see. So it went in search of the cure. The cure for me was his beauty. The remedy for me was to love. Wow, isn't that like gorgeous? Mm -hmm. Isn't that like yummy, 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 yummy? I can read it again. My eye kept telling me something is missing from all I see. So it went in search of the cure. The cure for me was his beauty. The remedy for me was to love. He is our cure. You know, I was so sick before satsang. The whole night I was sneezing and uh, I, I was uh, scared that I will sneeze on you and you will be infected. <laughs> but now with satsang he stopped my runny nose and he stopped he i could i could i thought i would just like uh say a few words but you know master does miracles <laughs> uh, it's love and paying karma <laughs> slicing potatoes it helps putting my hands on a pot on a broom in a wash pail i tried painting but it was easier to fly slicing potatoes I don't understand this poem, but maybe some of you do. <laughs> in my soul, in my soul, there is a temple, a shrine, a mosque, a church where I kneel. Prayer should bring us to an altar where no walls or names exist. Wow. Wow. Prayer should bring us to an altar where no walls or names exist. No barriers. Love has no barriers. Is there not a region of love where the sovereignty is illuminated nothing? 
Is there not a region of love where the sovereignty is illuminated nothing, where ecstasy gets poured into itself and becomes lost, where ecstasy gets poured into itself and becomes lost, where the wing is fully alive, but has no mind or body. Where the wing is fully alive, but has no mind or body. That is the soul. In my soul, there is a temple, a shrine, a mosque, a church that dissolve, that dissolve in God. Wow. In our soul, there is a temple here at the third eye center in this holy body where we dissolve, dissolve in God. When we enter, when our soul enters the third eye, when master graces us and pulls us up, then we dissolve, we dissolve in love, we dissolve in God and we are no more. We are in love. Sometimes when we come out of meditation, you know, because we're not total yet, like Ishwarji, um, we, cannot, we cannot hold the experience of every level. And sometimes he puts blinders on us. But sometimes we are in a beautiful place, beautiful place, and we're having a godly experience. And then we come out, and then he, we come out from that level, and we come out to this level. And then that experience is mostly lost because that's how it is, that's how he made it. Uh, however, we bring with us the good feeling that, wow, I was in a, such a beautiful, beautiful place. Wow, I was in, in, in swimming in love. Wow, I, I was somewhere beautiful. We, we bring that experience from that spiritual level with us into this world. And that experience from that spiritual level that we bring to this world gives us like all infuses us with the energy with the divinity of god and makes us more give us more faith and more hope more hope um, and 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 more anticipation that the floodgates are going to break that the floodgates are going to flood us with love that what rabia said that the gift he gave that god gave her cannot be described that he came, he kissed her, the inner master with his radiant form kissed her and he never left. And, and her life was just God. And she was an instrument of God. God poured himself, the ocean poured himself into the drop. And the drop is no more a drop, but it became the ocean. And, and this is what happened to Rabia. Wow. Oh. This poem is called, It Works. Would you come if someone called you by the wrong name? I wept because for years he did not enter my arms. Then one night I was told a secret. Perhaps the name you call God is not really his. Maybe it is just an alias. I thought about this and came up with a pet name for my beloved I never mentioned to others. All I can say it works. <laughs> I don't know what she called her, what she called God, but my master Santakar Singh says, it doesn't matter if you call God G-O-D or D-O-G. He will listen to you anyway. <laughs> they might hold hands. Maybe if I brought the moon a little closer, lovers would argue less. They might hold hands outside and point to the heavens and say, I think God is up to something sweet. Beautiful. The way the forest shelters, God is our shelter. That was the Shabd of the beginning that Anu played. You are my shelter. By your grace, I understand you. We still don't understand God. We have, we're, every day we are more in understanding. I guess whoever wrote that was a perfect master. Now I understand you. The way the forest shelters. I know about love and way the fields know about light. The way the forest shelters. The way an animal's divine raw desire seeks to unite with whatever might please its soul without a single strange thought of remorse. There is a powerful delegation in us that lobbies every moment 
for contentment. There is a powerful delegation in us that lobbies every moment for contentment. How will you ever find peace unless you yield to love? Wow. How will you ever find peace unless you yield to love? The way the gracious earth does to our hands impulse. I love this. My poems attempt. All of what I would want my child to know. My poems attempt. We are infants before each other. Are we not? So vulnerable to each other words and movements. A school I sat in cured me of hurting others. I have come to see that all are seated at his table and I have become his servant. I have come to see that all are seated at his table. That is so, so, so true and so beautiful. That everything is God. Everyone is seated. There is no enemy. We have no enemies. Everybody is sitting on the divine table of God. And I have become his servant, she's saying. Sometimes God is too shy to speak in public and he pinches me. That is my cue. To fill in the blanks of your understanding the best I can. Okay, the, I'll read the last poem. She has many poems. I just bought this book, uh, Love Poems from God, Love Poems from God by Daniel Ladinsky. And I think I, think I bought it uh, very, very cheap because on Amazon, you can buy uh, uh, the, the books uh, used. So this one is used, but it will tell you if it's in good condition. And you can get like a beautiful book like this for like five, $6. And originally, it's like 15 or 17. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll read another one. If I did not pray, I could not move again. I could not move against this wind if I did not pray. And all that is said of me that is untrue would make claim my gates if I could not free myself from the weight of others' malice. I could not move against all his light if I did not pray. See how things become. What a change can happen when we find a way to keep him close. Wow. See how things become. What a change can happen when we find a way to keep him close. Beautiful. Okay, one more, one more. Trying to work it. Trying to work in. Once I heard two camels talking. They were complaining about all the weight they have to carry when they cross the desert. And they were especially peeved about that new camel whose only load was the master's young daughter who would often pet the camel and even sing to it sweet songs while they had to often feel the whip of men and listen to them tell crude stories of romantic exploits an older camel was overhearing the chat and i was and spoke saying you know it is our habit to bite when we when we are grouchy and just yesterday i saw you snap at the man who whipped you Maybe you shouldn't bite. Maybe the master has two daughters who sing and pet. Wow. And although this may be stretching things a bit, I am reminded of some words of wisdom. I have been trying to work it in somewhere for days. Those who are trusted by others, God trusts. Those who are trusted by others, God trusts. Wow, wow. This poem is so deep. And it's saying, the, she's telling the camel that don't bite because there might be another daughter that the master has, another beautiful daughter that can pet you. But if you bite, then she, the, the, the master will not put his daughter on, on your back. And uh, this is just like, this is just saying that if somebody hurts us, we, could, we should not react back. We should just, if somebody, like Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on the right, then offer the left. 
and uh, and uh, see all the poems have some deliciousness in them deliciousness and light that is really like half is said lifted to our lips and we drink we drink from the light of these poems and they keep us going just like Rabia is saying that she attained her master 24 7 and Rumi and Hafiz and Shams all of us all of us we just have to keep that depth of the moment we have to make every moment very deep by adding God to it every moment in our life we make it deep by adding God to it and then that becomes the depth of the moment and really at some point that depth is, that's going backwards in us is going to expand our awareness it's going to be our awareness is going to become so deep that it's going to be the awareness of god it's going to be the awareness of the kingdom of god we're going to be expanded expanded in awareness and we will be deep deep a deep human being a deep human being a deep human being has god and the kingdom of god that it has depth that i love that the depth so let's try to catch every moment and make it deep as much as we can by his grace, by the grace of the master, we pray that he makes every moment deep and add himself to our moments, every moment, to the present, that we catch hold of the present, make it deep. Um, thank you, master, for the seva. Uh, and now I'm looking forward for our next, uh, for our next uh, um, seva. And uh, and uh, 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 it's going to be Jaspreet. And uh, the title is The King and His Three Questions. I listened to part of it this morning, but I wanted to keep the rest as a, uh, as a surprise. So I'm looking forward for Jaspreet and for her seva. So let's enjoy. Let's enjoy. Hello everyone. Today I will be reading a short story called The King and His Three Questions. I hope you enjoy it the same way that I did. Here it goes. Once in a village there was a king who was very powerful and also very spiritual. He knew the answer to every question and he also was praised for his intelligence. One day he was reading a holy book when he was left rather mystified. After finishing the book, he had three questions about God in his mind that he was very eager to get the answers to. For this reason, the king called for his servant immediately and told him to search everywhere for someone who had the answers to these three questions. You must find me, whoever it is that knows the answer to this, and bring him or her to me, ordered the king eagerly, to which the servant nodded and began the search. The king was very impatient and wanted his questions answered as quick as possible, so he also decided to announce that whoever could give answers to these three questions to his satisfaction would be rewarded with half of his kingdom, but if they would fail to answer pleasingly, they would be hung to death. Many people tried to answer the king's questions, but not being able to satisfy the king, they all lost their lives. The servant just could not find anyone who could answer the questions to the king's satisfaction. The king was getting very restless and impatient for not getting acceptable answers. Therefore, he ordered his minister, who was one of the most intelligent men in his kingdom, to help him find the right answers. Otherwise, he would also have to face the same fate as the others did, that could not satisfy answers. The minister went home extremely worried as he himself did not know how to satisfy the king, and as the answers to these questions were based on his faith. Once he reached home, he sat down at his table and was worrying about the three specific questions the king had asked him to find. Looking at the anxious and worried face of his father, the minister's young son asked for the reasons for his concern and worries. 
the minister hesitantly looked at his son and then described to him all that had happened in the king's court. Son, said the minister, the king has asked me three very hard and mysterious questions and I don't know the answers to them. He will kill me if I don't have the answers by tomorrow morning. The son looked at his father and asked for the three questions. Upon inquiring by the son about the questions of the king, the minister mentioned to him these three questions. One, does God exist? Two, where is God? And three, what does he do? The minister's son assured his father that he will satisfy the king tomorrow in the king's court and reassured his dad that he didn't have to worry any more. I have the answers, father. There is no need for you to worry. The king will surely be pleased with my answers and you will be safe. The next day, the son arrived in the king's court where he met the king himself. The king was very surprised and confused to see this child and asked the minister for an explanation. The minister explained that his son would like to answer the questions for the king. After hearing this, the king was very hesitant but finally agreed to hear what the young child had to say. The minister's son started asking, Oh dear king, please tell me, what is your first question? The king got excited and exclaimed, Give me the answer to my first question. Does God exist? The son paused for a bit, smiled and then replied, I will certainly answer your question, but first I need a glass of milk. The king laughed out hysterically and couldn't comprehend what was going on, yet he decided to order the milk. When the glass of milk was given to the son, he started rotating his finger in the glass. Amused at the son's behaviour, the king curiously asked him what he was doing. To this, the child answered that he was trying to find the butter in the milk. The king laughed and said, You're a child. You don't know how to find the butter in the milk. The child asked, Why do you say so, dear king? Doesn't butter exist in milk? There is no doubt that butter exists in milk, replied the king. But to separate the butter from the milk isn't such a fast process. The milk has to set into curd and then be churned. After churning, only then the butter separates from the curd, the king explained to the child. The young child said to the king, Dear king, I have answered your first question. God resides in the whole universe, but to separate him from the universe, you need to focus your mind as well as churn the mind with contemplation on God. Only then you can separate God from the universe and see him clearly. Fully satisfied with the answer, the king quickly asked the second question. Well, where is God? The young boy said, I will also answer this question, dear king, but first I will need a candle. This time, the king didn't hesitate and ordered his servants to bring a candle immediately. The young boy took the candle and lit it. After this, he asked the king, Oh, dear king, Please tell me, which side the light is on the candle? The king was very puzzled and looked very carefully. After a few minutes, he said, the light is uniform in all directions. After this, the king was confused as to how this was relevant to his question. However, before the king could argue against the boy's question, the boy said, exactly, this is the answer to your second question. God is so powerful that he is uniform to every single one of us and he is in all directions. Anywhere you look, God is there. There is no place where God does not exist. The king was astonished and offered his reverence at the feet of the young child and sought the answer for his third and last question. Dear child, you have done very well so far, but for my last question I want to ask what does God do? The young child went quiet for a bit and looked at the king for a while, and then asked the king whether he was asking this question as a king or as a seeker to the truth. The king felt very ashamed, and said that he was asking the question as a seeker. Upon hearing the king's answer, the child said, If you are asking this question as a seeker, then how can you be seated on the throne higher than me, and make me stand on the floor below you? 
the king immediately stood up and requested the child to be seated on the throne and he stood on the floor with folded hands eager to get the answer as a humble seeker the young boy went to sit on the throne and continued saying dearest king this is the answer to your third and final question this is what god does he brings down the higher ones to the lower levels and uplifts the lower ones to the higher levels so that everyone is equal. The king's eyes lit up as he realised that the young minister's little son had managed to give all the answers of his complicated questions. The king was fully satisfied with all the answers and bowed down at the feet of this child who had enlightened him with the truth about God. He couldn't stop thanking the minister and his young son for the valuable knowledge and rewarded them with treasures and gifts as promised. We can all learn from this story. God resides in the heart of every living being. If you seek, trust and have faith in God, he will find you and show you to the right path. Every being should worship God so that one can connect with the power within himself. God exists everywhere in the universe, but to see him, we need to focus our minds, shift focus from the worldly matters to God within us, as well as contemplate on him repeatedly with our precious Simran. May Isha Puriji shower us with all his grace. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Wow, Jaspreet. I think we all loved your story. We all enjoyed your story. You are just a precious gift from Ishwar Puri Ji. You are Ishwar Puri's Ji. Grace showered on us. That's what you are, Jaspreet. Ishwar Puri's grace showered on us in your form, in the form of Jaspreet telling us the stories, the story of the king. We all loved it. Thank you so much for your seva. Please, please do more and more and more seva. You and your sisters and your mom and your grandmom and your uncle, all of you. I always, I always, we always look forward for your seva. Thank you so much. Uh, so now I will, um, uh, I can choose uh, a video of our Holy Father, Ishwar Puriji. I will do it uh, by random. So uh, in two minutes, we can meditate for two minutes and I'll, I'll pick a video. Thank you for coming to Satsang and thank you. I see Heather and Beth and Jyoti and Mike and thank you so much for your seva. And he had the first experience of the attention being pulled out. He got so frightened that he was going to die. He stopped meditation. And he went back to the great master and he said, Master, I'm not going to do this meditation. I was going to lose my life. You didn't tell me that this meditation makes you really die. <laughs> and the great master laughed and told him that, look, <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever died in meditation. They have not even died in natural death in meditation. <laughs> Secondly, if, if you die, if your attention is pulled off, what do you expect to see? He says, I expect to see you. I expect to see the master. And why are you worried? Why are you afraid? Then you go ahead and 
meditate. Don't do it in such a hurry. Don't be impatient. Take it stage by stage. When you do meditation and the attention is pulled out stage by stage, you lose your sense, sense of where the hands and feet are. Next day you lose the sense of where the legs have gone. The next day you feel a little bored. You get so used to it, it doesn't bother you. And by the time you are able to vacate your whole body by pulling the attention to the third eye center, you don't mind it at all. That's why great master himself recommended that you should do it stage by stage, what he called darja badarja. In, in Punjabi, he said, darja badarja, jana chahiye. Not that you should uh, say, I want to jump all the way, I'm impatient to see that. Because we're not used to it. So there's a good hint given to us that don't be impatient, take it easy, and go stage by stage. I also mentioned to the story of, um, in a smaller gathering, the story of Baba Jamal Singh, who was great master's master. And he, you, you have heard the story before, but I can repeat it again, because it has some significance for us. Baba Jamal Singh, as a, candidate, as a disciple of great master, of Swamiji, who was his master. His master was Swamiji Sethsip Dayal Singh from Agra. He got initiated from there. And he was living in Punjab, and Swamiji was living in Agra, in Uttar Pradesh, in UP, at quite a distance from Punjab. So it was not easy at that time to just travel all the time to go there. So they would make an appointment by writing letters. So Baba Jamal Singh wrote to Swamiji, Swamiji, I am suddenly feeling so much anxious to meet you. I am missing you so much. My heart wants to go run and see you. Please give me some time so I can see you. I am really missing you. He sent that letter. And Swamiji wrote back. Letters took a lot of time in those days. After a month, the reply comes. My dear son, Babu Jamal Singh, I am very happy to receive your letter. And I am very glad to know that your soul is roaming around in Khand Brahmant. Jamal Singh said, my soul is going nowhere. This must be letter meant for somebody else. He may, Swamiji might have made a mistake. And he thought it is for me. And he sent this letter. So he wrote again. He said, beloved master Swamiji, I must tell you, the letter you wrote to me was not for me because my soul does not go anywhere. I was just missing you and I'm still missing you. I just want to be with you. Please give me time to come to Agra and see you. After another wait of a month, another reply comes. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I have received your second letter. I'm very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in Khand Brahman. So far as coming to Agra is concerned, come in the first week of next month, I'll see. With these two letters in hand, Jamal Singh goes to Agra and presents them to Swamiji. Say, Swamiji, these letters were not for me because my soul was not going anywhere. And you addressed them to me. Swamiji laughed and said, Jamal Singh, let us go inside and meditate for a little while. There were 10 or 12 people, disciples of Swamiji, sitting outside. They both, Swamiji and Jamal Singh, went inside the little hut that they had. And after about half an hour, they both came out. And then Swamiji asked, Jamal Singh, now tell me, when I wrote those letters, was your soul not going around in the higher regions? Jamal Singh said, yes, Master. Swamiji said, I am not asking if during this session of half an hour of meditation, your soul went up. I am asking, when I wrote those letters, was your soul not going into Khan Brahman? He said, yes, Master, it was at that time. Then Swamiji turned to the other people who were sitting there and he said, when you miss your master so much that you can't do without going to see him, where is it coming from? It's the ascent of the soul inside, but you're blindfolded. You do not see where you have gone. The masters can blindfold you and let you do your worldly work, whereas you miss the master so much 
And that's coming from where? Coming from an ascent of the soul inside, ascent of attention inside to outside. You don't see it because there is no spectacle. There is no vision about what is happening. And then Swamiji explained that masters deliberately do this sometimes so that your karmic work, the work you have to do in this world for your living, for your taking care of family, for taking care of your karmic obligations can be done. Because it may happen that if your attention goes and you see there, you may never like to come back and do anything. And then the whole karmic pattern gets postponed to another time. They want you to finish your account and they help you to finish the account. Masters help you to finish the account you have, karmic account, while you are still in this world. And this is one of the ways of, ways of helping. They also lighten the burden in other things, which if, if it is too much. But this is one way that they can put blindfolds so you don't get stuck there and say, no, no, I can do the rest afterwards. They say, no, finish your karma. It's, it's only a light karma because now it's not for all the previous karma. It's only for this one life's karma. What you have pralabd. Now, when you say it's only light karma, what do they mean by that? What they mean is when a perfect living master initiates, gives nam to a disciple, he at that very time destroys all the reserve karma held in a cloud, which is being picked up again and again to make our destiny for different lives. Therefore, the only karma left after initiation is the pralabd, the destiny of this karma, of this life. And the only karma after that is what we create in this life. So it's a very light burden. The heavy burden was the sinchit karma, the reserve karma, sitting up in the cloud from where the time, time machine was pulling out karma and putting us into reincarnation again and again. That's not there anymore. Therefore, the karma becomes light. It's only the pralabd. It's only the only the destiny for this one life that you are going through. And you do create more karma during this one life. And that, if you have to come another life, if a second life after initiation is indicated, or you have to come, it's only based on the karma of the present life, and not any past lives. So that's a very big advantage, and you get lighter. Every time you have to come again after initiation, if you have to, it's always better, more conducive to meditation, more conducive to go on the spiritual path than before. So these are advantages. But when masters handle this problem of our karma, they make us go through it, but they do it in a certain way because they have a deal with the negative power that runs these three universes. Kal, the time frame, the time machine that's running these three universes. They, they, they are, there's a deal because we are, they are upsetting the time machine and pulling out souls from here. And therefore, they've said that we will not disturb the time machine. We won't disturb this universe of the three worlds. And therefore, they pull out. They say they pull out so smoothly, the souls. The example given is like pulling out a hair from butter. You know, if there's a hair stuck in a butter, you pull it so smooth, you don't even know you pulled it out. The soul is pulled out from this three-world pattern of the mind and call and time, like that smoothly. And for that, they do these wonderful things. They block anything that may makes you feel, let me postpone this karma here and go away. Another thing they do, which many people don't like, is when there's a little heavy karma to go through, they disappear. Not a good sign. You, you say, this is the time when I needed you. And you can't find. As soon as that hump is over, they reappear. They say, Master, what happened? Oh, really? You had to go through that? Oh, don't worry. Now it's over. Because they feel that if they intervened, you would not like to go through that karma and just postpone it. This kar karma is a strange thing. Karma consists of some strange elements which we don't realize. Karma is not a simple thing. 
Karma is not events. Karma can be emotional events, can be mental events, can be physical events. The pralabd we come with, the destiny we come with, consists of events like birth and death. Birth at a certain place, a fixed place which, over which we have no control. The previous karma is deciding where we are born, who will be our parents. And the whole thing sets off from there because we could be born in two different places and have entirely different kind of life. So that's a very major event, that where we are born with our past karma. Then we have accidents, we have um, coincidences, accidental meetings, we have married children, we have parents who are already there, we have relatives, we have friends, we have occupations, jobs, everything is laid out by the pralabd karma, by our destiny for which we come, right up to our death. And death is also determined the same way. This pattern of a lifetime has all these events already fixed into it. But in between these events, there are gaps left of a different kind of karma, which is not pralabd, which is not destiny. We call them kareman karma. Kareman means it's a new opportunity for us to act. Those new opportunities that come again and again in our lifetime are the ones where we have choices, where we use free will, where we say, should I do this or not do this? Those gaps we fill up with our choice making. When we make a choice, that's the establishment of a new karma, which we have to pay off later on. Therefore, if you look at life, you'll find that the gaps which we fill up are not so many as we think. The most of the events are prefixed, are already there. And within them, are, we are operating to use our free will, our choice to fill up those gaps. When we fill up those gaps, depending upon how we make a decision, and when we make a decision, what moral value we give to that decision determines the nature of that karma. Supposing in making a decision, our conscience says, this is not good. You are doing something wrong. Nobody else is telling us. Our own conscience is telling us from inside. This is wrong. We say, no, but it's good. I like it. I'm a bad person anyway. <laughs> At least it's pleasurable. At least I get some fun out of it. Or whatever reason, and we take that decision, is considered to be a karma deserving a punishment. We made it up. We decided to punish ourselves by doing that. Knowing it's going to be like this, we do it, we punish ourselves. Now that's standing as a punishment in the future. The punishment can come within the same lifetime or can come in the next lifetime. But it's held up there. If we say, this was a time for me to help somebody and that's a good deed I'm doing, as you are establishing that moral value that I am really doing a good deed for somebody or I'm helping somebody, it's a good thing I'm doing. You have established a karma which will give you a reward and will give a reward in the same life or in the next life or later on if it's held up as a good karma. It is these moments when we deliberate and see clear choices and say, I can do this or that and then take a decision that new karma is created, not otherwise. What you do automatically, instinctively, is not new karma. That's payoff of the old karma. Therefore, the new karma is confined to where free will has had to be used. Where you had to make a distinction between one choice and another and pick up one choice. Therefore, this, these two combinations of the pralabd and Kariman, this combination of the destiny and new actions works to create our future lives. But then it's not the actual act that creates the karma because karma is neither held on the body nor on the sense perceptions but on the mind. Karma is a mental activity. The mind creates karma and not the body. If the mind does not know and the body hits somebody, there is no karma. It's a payoff of the old one. If the mind knows I am going to hit, it's a new karma. 
And if you say, I want to hit that person and don't hit, even then it's a karma. So the karma is a mental activity. It's not a physical activity. And we make that mistake sometimes, thinking, oh, it's only in my mind. But even if you are in the mind, it's still a karma. So that way, by our mental activity and making decisions in our mind, we create a lot of karma. Karma can be paid off, of course, also mentally. Mental illness, mental deficiencies, they come up to pay, pay off old karma. Emotionally, we can pay off karma. We get emotionally wrecked by disappointments. We get wrecked by things not happening according to the way we want. Those are also karma. Most of them, emotional karma is from the past. But the mental karma where we decide what to do is for the future. Now the difficulty is that if you have a set of bad karma requiring punishment and a set of good karma requiring rewards, they don't cancel each other. That is the biggest snag in this whole system, that you can't cancel. You can't say, oh, I did something bad, now let me atone for it and do good things. You punish for the bad, you are rewarded for the good. Therefore, otherwise you could wipe out your karma. And because they both are independent, you can't do it. The story is told of Krishna, who was an enlightened avatar, an avatar, an incarnation of Vishnu, the god of sustenance of this world. And he, even from childhood, could speak up some great truths. And he was a cowherd. He used to take care of cows in the, for, in the pastures. And he had this very young student, uh, not, a, not a student, but a cl classmate, who used to go to village school. His name was Udo. And Udo and Krishna used to go together to look after the cows. One day, Krishna tells Udo, Udo, we cannot understand the nature of karma. He's telling as a child, Udo, we cannot understand the nature of the karma. It is so strong, holding us back. Look at this ant crawling, and he points to an ant that's crawling there. Look at this ant crawling. Looks like a little insect, a little ant crawling. Twice it has been Brahma, the creator of this universe. And once it has been Indra, the lord of a heaven existing. And now it's an ant because of karma. He got so much reward for the good things he did and became the creator of the three worlds. And he did so much evil that he has become, had to come back again as an insect. He says, karma is too strange. The words he used, which are now recorded, are karman ki gat nyari se. That's how they say in, in uh, eastern UP, Uttar Pradesh. And when I went to visit the land where Krishna worked and was born in that area in Uttar Pradesh, I saw poor people, the gardeners and others working there, singing in the evening. And this was the song they always sang. And this was the refrain of their songs. Are udo karman ki gat nyari se. Udo, you can't understand the nature of karma. It's not so easy as we think it is. And this was the whole thing. The complicated system of karma requires that we have to be here for good or bad. Yet masters have come here from time to time and have given us another way, a different way to overcome this problem. They said, if you want, really, you can lead a karma-free life. How can you lead a karma-free life if you have to make decisions all the time? They say, well, leave the decision to the master. Live in God's will. Live in master's will. If you're living in God's will or master's will, you don't make a decision. Somebody else makes a decision. If you have an enlightened good friend and he can decide things for you, don't jump in and say, I want to decide. Say, George knows best, he can decide. Your friend can uh, know better. You're not getting any decision making. 
This is a very important part that if you live in God's will, in the master's will, you don't create karma because you're not making a decision. You're living by his decision. But how do we do that? How do we know what is God's will and what is our mind's will? The truth is that there is a category of living. You can live like you know, one with mind's will and one with God's will or with the Guru's will. And the two categories of people are called Manmuks and Gurmuks. Manmuk is a follower of the mind and follows how the mind decides between choices and creates karma. The Gurmuk lives on the will of the Guru and follows that and does not create karma. How do we know if a particular action we take, if a guru is not there, God can't be seen, we can't ask him, is this your will or no? And we have to take a decision. How do we know which is God's will and which is our mind's will? There, of course, Rumi, Malana Rum, he gives an answer. He says, why do people ask me what is God's will? It's so simple. If he has placed a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will, dig. He has given a pen in your hand, he has expressed his will, right. He has placed circumstances indicating what to do, do it, that's his will. He simplifies it. That if you live by following the circumstances and coincidences around you, coincidences themselves are an expression of God's will, if you follow them. And then of course, more recently, the masters have further explained, that there are two functions in our mind. One is the mental decision making and the other is the intuitive decision making. There's a difference between the two. In the mental decision making, we always take time to decide because the mind has to reason what is better or worse and then take a decision. If the mind makes a decision, it's karma. Intuition does not have any time, it's a gut feeling that comes. When you follow that, no time has been taken. You have not taken a decision except the gut feeling that came and has no karma. People who live intuitively do not create karma. People who live mentally create more karma. There's another angle to it. How do we know it's true intuition or not? Some people mistake a quick mental judgment to be intuition. One man told me, a friend of mine, I have developing my intuition. I said, I don't know how to develop. I'm very glad. You tell me, how do you develop intuition? Give me an example. He said, I'm going to give you an example. I want to decide whether I want to go to that city tomorrow or not. Now I'll ask my intuition to give an answer. Uh, we'll go. I said, what was that? Ah, uh, there was time. <laughs> that was exactly the time that mind takes to make a decision. This was a mental decision, not intuitive. When the intuitive hunch comes to us, there is no time. It's just sudden, completely sudden. It's the sudden hunch that comes. Is there any way to verify if we get these intuitive hunches and we get this gut feeling, is there another way to verify whether really it was intuitive? Yes. The circumstantial evidence of coincidences outside corroborates whether the intuition was right or not. And you will find this remarkable thing. When you have a hunch, a gut feeling, then you go out and drive and see the same thing written on the billboard. It's a confirmation of your intuitive hunch. The more intuitive you become, the more coincidence of that kind happen. You can check them out in your life. So therefore, God speaks to us, Guru speaks to us, Master speaks to us in all these languages. And if we follow those, we are living in the Lord's will and don't create karma. So we can make, to quite a large extent, a life with much less karma than we have. So there are some guidelines to how to handle karma for a seeker, for a disciple of a perfect living master. So I'm giving, giving you these little hints because they work. You can test them out, they actually work. So the fact that karma works in a certain pattern and goes on till we die, leads us to the question, how is the next life created then? 
what part of the karma of one life is used to create the next life? Is it just all of it going in, in reflection into the next life? Not at all. Only some pieces are picked up from here and there. And from the reserve. Pieces are picked up from the reserve, pieces are picked up from here, pieces are picked up from the 10th earlier lifetime, 100th earlier lifetime, 50th earlier lifetime. It can be picked up from anywhere to make a new lifetime. There was a blind king in Mahabharat, Indian epic story, and he was blind in the time of Krishna. And he told Krishna, with your help, I have been able to look back into 100 of my past lives. And I don't remember anything I did to be blind in this life. How come I'm blind? And Krishna says, no, you have to go further back. 104th life, earlier fourth life, 104th life, you, as a king, took out the eyes of a man, and that's why you're blind. He says, after 104 lives, he says, there's no limit. Karma can be created from any of the past lives and brought it to make a new life. This arrangement is such that since we have had so many past lives, that we can continuously have lives even if we try to live karma-free. The only way the karma-free life can really help us is if we are initiated by a perfect living master and it destroys the cloud of all previous lives, karma. And the only thing left is the prarabdha, the destiny made for this life. And we pay off that in this life. And whatever we create, as then we can control. If we know this is the only life that can be used to make in the next life, we have a karma-free life, live in the will of the master, you don't have a next life. What happens when you die? Most people can't tell us. Some people have near-death experiences and they tell us they saw white light, they saw tunnels and so on. The, the doctors and psychologists say, no, no, that's only a remembrance of their birth canal and they came out and saw the light, so they see the light when they die. It's the memory going backwards. They give different explanations. What is the answer which mystics and the masters give us? They say, when you die, you suddenly find the world retracting from you, that you're being pulled away, and the whole of this life, the pictures of this life, runs like a movie in front of you. And you see all the events suddenly running in front of you. You see, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. Very rapidly, the whole life is replayed, as it were, in front of you. And at that time, the last few moments of your death, when this is happening, whatever your wishes at that time are, whatever you think of at that time, is the fundamental basis of the next life. Then other things are added on to it. They say the last moments, wishes and desires, are very important in establishing what your immediate next life will be like. But immediately after death, when you pulled out and you're disembodied, if you are not an initiate, you are brought before somebody, some character who has been assigned this role because of his good karma or bad karma, who sits as the Lord of Judgment on you. And he says, you saw the picture and now I'm going to tell you what, what is entailed for the next life. And he spells out. And he spells out that from the karma that you created, he tells us that it entails that you have done so much to go to hell. Three days in hell or ten days. You have done so much, you're entitled to heaven for a month. You've done so much to have these events in your life. But before we go into other forms of life that you can go into, including life forms other than human, you could go into a whole sequence of life forms starting from plant life all the way to insects, birds, mammals, and human again. By your karma, you have created the cycle of rebirth and different life forms. But before any of that starts, it'll always go in the same order. By the way, that order happened to be Darwinian order also. I was seeing the sudden coincidence. Before we start the Darwinian order of not, you don't have to go through all life forms. 
only some of the selected ones but the order is always in the same before you go into that order you decide you want to go to hell or heaven first last choice you are going to make with your free will after that till you become human you will have no free will but this is the last opportunity to exercise free will some people like to go to hell first get it out of the way and some want to go to heaven maybe in heaven we may pray and avoid the hell all kinds of thoughts come i have sometimes in 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 these meetings taken a poll how many people if they got a chance that they had to go one month to heaven one month to hell where would they like to go first i am going to check what is your opinion if you all had a choice and you have to spend one month in heaven and one month in hell how many of you would like to go to hell first okay how many of you would like to go to heaven first pretty well divided <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's always been my experience it's pretty much divided and there must be some good reasons why we have such a 50-50 uh, poll on, on this issue but that is the last choice we get on the law of karma after that the different life forms we have they have a very strange effect again on on karma because every life form you go through leaves its imprint before you move to the next for example if you have a karma where you have to be a tree you have to be wooden tree for 100 years you stand in the garden as a wooden tree with a subdued consciousness of a tree you can't do anything but you're conscious that you are a tree you're conscious the other trees around people are there you're conscious of that you can't speak you can't communicate you can't move you're stuck till you die as a tree for that long period you carry that wooden tree experience to the next life supposing you have only two lives tree and human and nothing in between that was all your karma you will find yourself wooden and tree like even when you are human this carries on it's amazing every experience supposing you had the experience of being a dog before you became human the dog's attributes come up as a human being you'll have a tendency for that so it's not merely that they stand alone by themselves every form of life in which we appear carries its imprint into the next one and ultimately when we become human we are carrying the imprints of lot of life forms and that's why we behave in all those forms it's a very complex uh, sanskar sanskar means the establishment of attitudes based upon all previous lifetimes sanskar is different from karma because sanskar this that is the sanskars sanskar means the accumulated effect of all the previous karma is not one events that come are one life this event happened there this is happening now but sanskar is cumulative and sanskar develop our attitude and our attitude is very uniform it hardly changes i have seen that the attitude of people does not change but with the perfect living masters initiation it does change i have seen that so it's it's accumulated thing how does it change with the perfect living master initiation because the very cloud carrying all the previous sinchit karma is destroyed and immediately leads to change of attitude because that's no longer affecting your attitude if you watch people closely if you watch initiates closely and i watched initiates all my life and i watched closely how they react when they come and get initiation how they are before how they are after how it happens as they progress <laughs> that the distinct change of attitude comes after initiation and the attitude towards people attitude towards things begins to change so that's a, that's because of the law of karma it's all built into this particular law so karma is not that simple like it's just action reaction it has all these strange features in it if you are initiated by a perfect living master 
you do not go to any other life form except a human life form if you have to. Do you have to go to another life form? Not necessarily. One day, great master gave a discourse and he said, if you are initiated by a perfect living master, you will not have to go through more than four better and better human lives. My dad was not there on that satsang, on that discourse. He heard it from somebody else. And he ran to the great master. And he said, Master, I understand that you said today a person initiated by a perfect living master cannot have more than four lives. Is it true? And master says, Lake Raj, why are you worried? This is your last life. Why are you worried about four lives? He says, no. I am worried that if I want a fifth one, I won't get it. <laughs> he said, why would you think of a fifth one? He said, because who knows, you may come again and again. Some people say, masters come again and again. You decide to come fifth one, will you leave me behind? Great master then explained. He said, four lives is mentioned as a limit. It's not necessary for everybody to have four lives. Indeed, if a person after initiation by a perfect living master follows the instructions of the master, just follows the instructions of the master, this is his last life. He is not reborn again. If a person after initiation cannot follow fully, tries but misses, fails, tries, misses, he may come for one more lifetime, which would be a better lifetime where he can follow the instructions. Only where a person gives up the path, and does not want to follow at all, he comes for another third life. Only a person who goes against the path, against the master, works against the master, comes for the fourth life. It's not that everybody is coming for the fourth life. Most people who are following the instructions of a master, this is their last life. And therefore it is, it's not, this story went around that we have to have come four lives. That's not true. That's not according to the power of the initiation of a perfect living master, which takes care of you. He, he can also intervene in this karma. A divine intervention is possible to lighten even the existing product karma. But what happens because of the deal that masters themselves have made with the lord of these regions, the time frame, the time machine that is running these regions, because of that deal, they say, okay, if you want your pound of flesh, we'll give the pound of flesh before we go. If they help a person, very often they take the karma upon themselves. If they find that the disciple is really in pain and agony, and as human beings, they have utmost compassion. They are very compassionate human beings. And with that compassion, they don't want the person to suffer or not suffer so much, they can take on, but then they, they pay the price. But the price they pay is much less because the negative power itself is not wanting them to suffer. So when they take a little suffering on behalf of their disciples, the negative power itself is anxious they should not suffer. So they can take a little bit and it solves a large amount of karma. It takes away the large amount of karma of that disciple. People have to go through some very tough karma and masters. They can get injured on their hands. They can get injuries on their body. They can fall, fall sick. There was a case where a man had a very heavy karma. We all have very different loads of karma. But one was a very heavy load of karma and could not have been ready for initiation in this life, could have been ready next life with the grace of a master who darshan he had had. But his friend, who was a disciple of great master, was very keen to give him the initiation. He kept on pleading to the master. Master, he is my friend. I love my friend. Forget all his weaknesses. You don't judge people. So just initiate him. And the great master said, for your sake, I will initiate your friend. But then I'll go back straight home. I'll cut my tour short. 
and he initiated that person, went back and had a high fever for himself, which he predicted in advance. So masters can take on their bodies, on visible karma, which we can see for the sake of the disciples. Some disciples say it's very unfair to load a master with our karma. What kind of Sikhs are we, what kind of Sikh disciples are we, that instead of helping the master do his work, we are putting our karma on the master. That's not fair. The question is, the answer master gives is, look, I'm helping you with this much load of karma. I'll be able to do it with this little. Therefore, it's a good deal. Don't worry about it. But still, people, this loving disciples, they don't want even to give that much of karma to the master. Eventually, it is all left to the discretion of the master. And when we live in the will of the Lord, he determines how much we can take, how much he needs to help us, and we go through karma. I have told you all these things about the law of karma, because very often we don't hear these details, and we think karma is a very simple process, do good and you are rewarded, do bad and you are punished. It's much more complicated and has a cycle of events that goes with it. So, so far as we are concerned, the best is to create as little karma as we can in this lifetime. And that is by living in the Lord's will. Which means we look up and see what the coincidences are telling us, what our hunch is telling us, what Master's talk is telling us, what specific instructions he has given us are telling us, follow them. If you follow all these things, you'll be on the right track. If sometimes you get confused that we have these two options, we can go this way or this way, and Master's not here, we can't contact him, we can't telephone him, we can't speak to him. How do we know which way to go? Is there a rule of thumb that we can apply to what we should do? The rule of thumb is, look at the two options. The one that brings you closer to the master is to be preferred over that which takes you away from the master. The one that makes you think more of the master is to be preferred over that which does not. There's a rule of thumb that you will find if you apply this rule of thumb in making your daily decisions, you'll be generally quite right. And therefore, you'll make the right choices. Of course, you can also, in meditation, ask the master and repeat the words of Simran. And very often, either directly in meditation or coincidentally, next day, you'll get the answer. So then you don't have a problem because you're living in the will of the master. And you can create a more or less karma-free life and reduce the burden and follow the instructions of the master and go back home in this very lifetime. In this age, this is called the Iron Age, the Kali Yuga, the grace and generosity of the Master is flowing more than ever before. I can tell you that. This is the time to keep our cups open, to get filled up. People say, why don't I get enough grace of the Master? The well, grace of the Master is flowing all the time. It flows like rain. When rain falls, the shower is falling. It's like grace. If you have a cup and put it upside down in the rain, it never gets filled up, no matter how much the shower is. But if you turn it around a little bit, a few drops go in. If you turn it straight up, it gets filled up very quickly. What is this cup we are talking of? This cup is the cup of our own attention. If our attention is entirely the world, it's upside down. If our attention is towards the master, it's upside up, it's up, filling up with grace. Grace is never stopping. It's our cup that we manage, our attention that we manage, which side we put it. If we put it up, it gets filled up. If our attention is on the master, day and night, walking, talking, thanking him for everything, the cup is up, and grace comes and we experience it. 
And if our attention is worldly, I say, Master, I tried to do this work, you didn't help me. Master, I failed in that job. Master, I couldn't do that. Your attention is all on the worldly things, and all that you want is for worldly activities. Grace is there, cup is empty, because it's not turned in the right direction. So keep the cup of your attention, the direction of the Master, and His grace will fill it up. I'm very happy you paid such attentive attention to what I was saying. And keep it and practice what I've been saying. Keep it as a guideline. This is just guidance. It can only be actually worked out if you meditate, go within, and check it out. Do not believe any word of mine unless you check it out yourself inside. That is the principle on which great master's teachings work that you can hear these things, but check them out. All these things that I say, the truth about them is lying inside you. All the questions you have, the answers are lying inside you. If you go within, you'll get the answers to all these things. We'll have a short break for questions. Those who are initiated will use their mantra given by the masters. Those who are not initiated can use a temporary mantra created by themselves expressing love for somebody. Close your eyes. Imagine this body of yours is your house in which you live. It has several floors. The lowest floor is right where you are sitting down at the bottom. Then as the floors rise, you are the sixth floor behind the eyes. And that's the place where you will always meditate. That is your meditation chamber. So go and imagine you are sitting in the middle of this meditation chamber. And you can examine that the house, this body-like house around you on the sixth floor, that you are sitting on top of your throat, you're sitting on top of your body and the ears are around you and the eyes are in front of you. Your hair is on top of you and you are sitting relaxed, totally relaxed, no tension. The body has nothing to do with it. There's no pressure on the body or the head or the eyes. You are using your imagination to sit behind the eyes in the center of the head. and. Whatever comes in front, look at it, but don't follow it. If any sounds come, listen to the sounds attentively, but don't move towards them. If a sound comes from the top, listen while you're sitting relaxed in the center. Sound comes from the right, listen from the center. Sound comes from the left, stay in the center and listen to it. If two sounds come, pick up the one coming from the right or above and drop the other. And if a sound seems to be around you, pick up that and listen to it attentively. Put all your attention on the sound when the sound comes. Meanwhile, keep on repeating the words. If the sound disappears, go back to repetition. And when the sound comes, drop the repetition, listen to the sound. 